Morning, kids. I know you're still dizzy after cryosleep, but we don't have much time to use this room, so let's get down to business. Though, it seems that our guest of honor is late. Ah oh, well, not that they matter too much. So, as you probably noticed, right now we're approaching our first objective, one of four Yanari planets that the HQ wants us to capture in this war. They have a decent presence there, but that presence has been bombed to shit by Mantico, so by now we're mostly dealing with separated groups, who spent last few months hiding underground. Which should make our job easier, if the brass is correct. Once we deal with some initial defenders, the rest should be just a matter of time. Hell yeah! Can't wait to skewer me some crocodile slaving bastard! Sit your ass down, Spikey, and listen. Unless our enemies get right on top of us, you keep that stupid knife holstered until I order you to use it. You all have guns that can reliably hit the target few kilometers away, so how about we actually try to use them like we're supposed to? Last thing we need is some more trigger-happy attitude. We lost nearly everyone on voice because of it. Wait, Sarge, you've been on voice? Yeah, and I left a good mate down there, so no more pointless dying on my watch unless I specifically order you to. Got it, Corporal Furball? Ah, look who it is, our very special guest, Private Boneface. What took you so long, kid? Apologies, sir, but I've just been following army protocol. Per standard procedure, a soldier is expected to perform at least 20 minutes of physical activity after waking up from cryosleep, sir. Yeah, sure, except for those moments where your commanding officer gives you a direct order to move your ass. I'm pretty sure that's also covered in the manual. It is, sir. However, I thought that, because the manual was written by a colonel, its rules should be applied before yours. But since it's obviously not true, I must ask, how exactly am I supposed to discern which orders to follow first? Simple. The ones that will cause you the least amount of trouble. And believe me, right now I could cause you more issues than that colonel and entire Yanari army combined. So take a seat and listen up. As you all know, the Vryn are currently being deployed all across the Commonwealth to figure out what they're good at and what they want. The Eggheads ran some tests and assigned each and every one of them a role depending on their aptitude. Which means that Private Boneface over there is the newest addition to our team, and will use that opportunity to learn something about the world. Now, as for us, you don't have to worry, this will not be a babysitting mission. My new friend went through the same training as you guys, so he'll have the basics covered. All we have to do is to show him what it means to be the part of a unit. And as for you, new guy, I don't want any heroics from you, got it? You stay back, keep your head down, watch and learn. Anything goes wrong, you hide behind Corporal Furball. Any questions? Yes, sir. I have been told that the Commonwealth is renowned for its tolerance towards other species. However, ever since I joined your unit, I couldn't help but overhear many of our soldiers, including you, sir, using various derogatory nicknames in conversation with their comrades. That? Don't worry about it, it's just something soldiers do to relieve stress of upcoming battle. That, oh, Sergeant Sweaty over there is jealous that some of his female subordinates have more chest hair than he does. I think he may be insecure. And you're jealous that I don't have to pant like a dog to get colder. But that's the gist of it, kid. Nobody means anything bad by it. And besides, that's just basic observation. Corporal Furball is called like that because, come on, just look at her. Private Spikey got his nickname because he has those freaky pointy things on his face. You wish you could grow them like that, boss. Heard your ladies love them. Yeah, shame that yours don't. And you, kid, you have that bone ridge on your face. Hence Private Boneface. I see. Thank you for clarifying that, sir. Though I'm not sure I'll partake in using those nicknames, if you don't mind, because I feel no stress that needs relieving. I undertook training, I am aware of my duties and risks that they entail, and I am not afraid. And that's exactly the problem, Private. But that's why you're here, to learn that feeling, because only thanks to it we managed to get this far. But don't worry, once the real bullets start flying, you're gonna figure it out in no time. Greetings, fellow worshippers of everlasting lights, and you too, vile shadow heretics, and welcome back to Second Chance. Previously, we learned that humanity has, thanks to amazing effort of Biosock Division, learned how to create intelligent life from scratch, and although said life is not exactly perfect, it's still a remarkable achievement, especially since we can learn from mistakes we made and improve any further projects that way. Sadly though, while the experiment was a success, it was vastly overshadowed by yet another war, this time against Yanari League, our long-standing rivals. 
Initially, they were at war with galactic intent to our southwest, but after our friends suffered some defeats and setbacks, Commonwealth decided to intervene and, as you can see, our forces are already on the way towards Thrus Sangor, the first of four Yanari planets that we want to conquer in this war. Luckily for our ground pounders, though, our crocodile enemies offer very little resistance in this first fight. And no wonder, considering that their planet was under constant bombardment by Task Force Mantico for nearly half a year. So by the time our troops landed, there were no organized Yanari defenses on the surface, only scattered pockets that had to constantly stay hidden to avoid being annihilated from above. So, naturally, the vast majority of our enemies have been broken within a few days, and after that it was just a matter of disarming the prisoners and taking out the most fanatical Yanari units, who refused to surrender no matter what. In the end, entire invasion took less than two weeks, but of course that is only the very first step of our operation, and just the beginning of our problems. For one, that Yanari fleet that broke intense forces is still somewhere out there, and while it is weaker than Mantico, it's still powerful enough to cause us some serious problems, so we can't just blindly charge forward and risk getting outflanked by them. And secondly, actually holding through Sango is probably going to be much harder than taking it. We only have one army, and that army will have to move out soon in order to continue our attack, and once they leave, we will have almost no means of preventing any Yanari counterattacks. Not to mention that the population hates us and will surely revolt as soon as we're gone. So, in order to deal with that problem, or at least to slightly reduce it, General Aspinaka, against orders of his superiors in general staff, decided to arm several million former Yanari slaves and use them as an improvised militia that will pacify their former masters. It probably won't prevent a rebellion, but it may at the very least delay it and turn Yanari attention to their own people. Though, in all honesty, that militia will probably cause just as much harm as it will do good. Yanari are, after all, rather aggressive people, and as soon as those slaves were armed, they immediately stormed off into the countryside, hoping to find their former owners and exact some bloody vengeance on them. For now, Aspinak and his troops are still going to stay on the surface, because Admiral Ibrahim needs to clear a path first, so we should be able to exert some control over these militia units, but as soon as we're gone, streets of Thrust Sango are probably going to drown in blood of masters and slaves alike. But while attention of our military is turned to the west, in the northern part of our country there was yet another remarkable breakthrough. After several years of extensive cooperation between our researchers and Bouvandon society, their civilization has learned the basics of interstellar flight and officially joined interstellar community as Commonwealth Protectorate. Currently, their technological level is similar to ours from around a century ago, but considering how amazingly quickly these Fangoids processed new knowledge brought by our people, it's safe to say that they probably won't remain backwards for long. Especially since their entire race has united into a single confederation, led by the most pragmatic and resourceful of their people, a far cry from the various monarchies that dominated the planet just a few years ago. Still, while Bouvandon progress is impressive and the scientists are clearly brilliant, they have a long way to go. For one, the wisdom we brought them will have to first be accepted. Sure, we teach their smartest minds how to travel to the stars, but for the vast majority of the population that's basically magic, given that they were in the middle of Steam Age, it's pretty much the same as, say, trying to explain nuclear fusion to a random soldier from American Civil War period. Not only it's way complicated than anything these creatures could ever imagine, they lack the very vocabulary needed to comprehend ideas like that. Fortunately, technology is something that everyone adapts to sooner or later, especially if said technology can make one's life easier. So in time, Bouvandon society will surely wrap their heads around all these revelations we dropped onto them. For now though, that sheer overwhelming alien, one could say, amount of new information resulted in growing distrust towards other races. One day, they were tilling the fields with plows, and another one a bunch of magical space wizards came from the clouds and gave them machines that could do a yearly walk of several towns and villages in a matter of hours. Useful, sure, but doesn't change the fact that shock of it was overwhelming, especially since not one of them can actually understand how these machines work. Add to that sudden realization that the galaxy is inhabited by creatures creatures and civilizations that could wipe their entire race out in a matter of days, and no wonder they're rather distrustful.
distrustful of our presence on their world, so for now, we'll leave them alone and let them govern themselves, with slight guidance here and there, and hope that, in time, they will accept their new reality. Not that they have any other option, of course. But speaking of protectorates, you may remember that we have two new ones to the north, and because our construction crews have finished building wormhole stations that link Commonwealth and these two states, it's a good time to take a closer look at them. First, we have Sovereign Meshbent Technocracy, a rather interesting choice of name, considering their current diplomatic status. Natives to planet Sinoshur in Galpan system, they are a nation of rather disturbingly looking creatures that first took to the stars around 30 years ago, and immediately realized that they're completely surrounded by other far more advanced and powerful neighbors, and let's not forget that one of these neighbors at the time was Billy One Mind. As a result, their society, just like the Bouvondon, developed a certain distrust towards aliens, knowing full well just how weak they were compared to them. Aside from that though, they are surprisingly similar to us. They value personal freedoms and individuality, and their decision making is usually rational and grounded in pragmatism. So much so, in fact, that as soon as they realized just how technologically backwards they were when compared to their neighbors, they dissolved their old nations and organized themselves under a single banner as a science directorate, which means that their entire country is run by the best and brightest scientists, and its main focus is to expand their understanding of the universe even if that means abandoning fully-fledged democracy behind. But sadly, they are slightly thwarted by their own nature. Sure, they are imaginative and innovative people, but they do suffer from two problems. Firstly, their fertility rates are extremely low, due to very long time that is needed for their young to develop. And secondly, they tend to be rather relaxed creatures, which is a good thing when it comes to keeping public order, because it's almost impossible to anger them, but not that great when work needs to be done. So, while they are smart and can easily adapt to new ideas and develop new technologies, actually building said technologies may be a bit more problematic. Fortunately, laziness is one of the major mottos of progress, so let's hope they won't lag behind too much. Plus, we know why so many of them choose careers in politics now. Next, we have the Tejnid Enlightened Kingdom, a nation in exile reduced to a single planet after Dis Ravages captured their homeworld and the rest of their country. Originally native to planet Tejna, where no signs of their people remain today, these insectoids have suffered greatly ever since they took to the stars. First, they were at war with the Fafsim Dominion to their north, then they suffered a civil war that tore their nation in half, and finally, what remained was conquered by the Dis, leaving just a single planet of battered, exhausted and bitter survivors, who had to abandon their pride and monarchist traditions and look for protection under Commonwealth wing. But they also had a secret, one that was no longer possible to hide when our diplomatic delegation landed on their world. Because when our people disembarked from their shuttles, they were not greeted by the Tejnid, but by some completely different race of blue-skinned, pointy-eared humanoids that we never even knew existed. At first, our representatives thought that maybe these aliens, who called themselves Misha, were some kind of honor guard, because they were clearly strong and well-built, but as they moved towards Royal Palace, they realized that the streets were full of them, but there was no Tejnid in sight. And soon we learned why. The Misha, as it turned out, have also evolved on Tejna, but unlike their insectoid companions, they were less intelligent, and just like Kathemas did with Yuvanux back on Yadrani, the Tejnid have used this human noise as unskilled labor force. They kept doing that for centuries, but in the end, around 50 years ago, the Misha decided that they would rather be treated as equals, not second-rate citizens. An idea that their king refused, which caused these normally passive and calm people to revolt, which was that civil war that was mentioned before. The monarchy lost that war, and the vast majority of the Misha left for Tejnid alliance to the west, where they could finally be free. A handful of them, those more used or tied to their masters, stayed, but the damage was already done. Divided, the Tejnit couldn't survive invasion of these berserkers and paid the highest price. So high, that their entire race, with exception of their royal family, has been wiped out. Which leads to this bizarre state that is now our protectorate. A nation inhabited by one race, ruled by a handful of remnants from another one. No wonder they tried to keep it a secret during initial negotiations. 
At first, we wanted to call the deal off immediately, not only where we lied to, but a segregation like that is something that Commonwealth definitely does not approve. But as our delegates marched into the royal palace and talking over Thaz what they thought about his deception, they were surprised when his majesty just agreed with them. I know, he said, that my actions were not as transparent as they probably should have been, but I only wanted to ensure the safety of my subjects. The deal we made was to bring the kingdom into the Commonwealth and adapt your democratic principles as soon as diplomatic and administrative issues are resolved. Once everything is prepared, I will abdicate and the Misha will become your citizens. Surprised by that claim, Commonwealth diplomats ask if King's decision won't cause problems with his heir, but the answer they received was something they were not ready for. There was no heir. King Ober Saz was not only the last of the royal family, he was the last of entire Tejnid race, his entire species exterminated by the Dis. With his death, the extinction will be complete. After these words, silence fell in the room, and then, one by one, our delegates bowed down and never mentioned King's deception again. He may not have been the best monarch, but it's clear that by now he's just a broken old man with no hope for the future. No need to kick him down any further. The least we can do now is to ensure that his bishop subjects will be safe and free within our nation. If we want to protect them, however, we must first ensure our own safety, so it's time to get back to the war, especially since there has been some development on the Anari front. As was said, our ground troops remained on the surface of the planet we conquered, while Mantico moved out to our next objective, a Vasanea system. But because we're using wormholes, it means that they first had to get back into our territory and jump again from there, and during that time, the Anari fleet had a chance to respond to us. And, as you can see, we got outmaneuvered. While Manticore moved to prepare another planet for invasion, our crocodile enemies rushed through several of their systems and moved towards Ebukrosi where our army is now stranded, without means of defense. Now, Aspinaka's men have been busy in these past weeks and managed to rebuild the vast majority of planetary defenses, but that's not going to help them if that Yanari fleet will begin full orbital bombardment. At best, we can only delay them. So we have two options either trying to evacuate our forces and let Yanari retake their planet, or stay on the surface, dig in, and wait for Manticore to return. And, as you might expect, General Aspinaka took the second option, although he will actually send back some of his spiders, not because they wouldn't be useful during eventual Yanari attack, but because he was afraid of them breaking out of containment during orbital strikes and causing chaos among the population and military alike. After all, we want to actually hold these planets once we conquer them, and unleashing a horde of bloodthirsty arachnids is not exactly something that would endear us to the locals. So, our soldiers will have to hold on while Mantico races back, but in the meantime, back home, we received another unpleasant diplomatic information. Another country, this time the Fifth Grand Union, decided to suspend migration between our countries, which, like in Utkavongo case, is probably dictated by the recent shift in their government. As you may remember, when we first met Fedgrants, they were an overly curious explorers, whose passion for science was even greater than our own. But recent events, however, turned their leaders towards more militaristic rhetoric, which, in turn, resulted in closing borders, so that potential recruits and walkers won't just flee into our ever-growing commonwealth. So, just like with our northern neighbors, this decision is perhaps justified, especially considering that Fifth Grand Union is now sharing a border with Eternal Empire, but it still means that we've lost another nation that, not that long time ago, was very friendly towards us, and we even discussed forming a federation of our own. There's also a possibility that Thadrakis' families had something to do with it, since they too grew more distant in recent years, but unless we know for sure, we're not going to point any fingers, especially since we have a lot of work ahead of us. Sadly, there is another issue, and this time it's one that we can't do anything about. As you can see, we deployed our construction ships, those not busy with building our sentry array, to Ebukrosi system to establish wormhole stations there to speed up our movement inside Yanari territory. But while it will help us moving from system to system, it does nothing to speed our movements once we actually reach said systems. And in Ebukrosi's case, this is actually a serious problem. 
because, as you can see, this system is extremely large, which means that once our ships enter it, they still have to spend at least three or four months in transit before reaching the only habitable planet. And for Manticore, it's closer to five months, because they are slowed down by Seers of the Archon. That's bad news for our army, who, as you could have seen there, will very soon be trapped on Thrust Sangor, but, as said, there really isn't anything we can do about it, aside from developing new, better engines, something that won't help us right away. We could theoretically detach our Dreadnought and leave it behind, but the Yanari have already proven that they can outflank us, so it would be too risky to have Arkan just follow behind on its own. So in the end, there was only one solution. After long debriefing, General Aspinaka told Admiral Ibrahim to keep her fleet together and stick to the plan. He and his men will hold on and try to buy her time, because if they manage to hold the Yanari fleet above them, Manticore will have a chance to catch up to them and wipe them out, gaining decisive advantage in this war. Time for our troops to dig deep as bunk as they can and disappear underground, and for our deckers to push their ships to their limits. Speaking of ships, you surely notice that we now have quite a lot of them, and despite the losses they usually take, we actually greatly increased the number of our corvettes, to 51. Thing is, only one of these corvettes is actually a regular one, another 50 are our heavy torpedo boats, armed not with one, but with two launch tubes, and as for torpedoes themselves, they are actually our newly developed Devastator torpedoes, which are faster, more resilient, and carry even greater payload than previous model. Just three or four good hits and they can take out a battlecruiser. And because we have so many of them, it means that every 20 seconds, Mantico can fire an overwhelming barrage of 100 torpedoes at its enemies, so even though the guiding systems of these munitions are not great, the sheer number of them guarantees that we'll do serious damage to enemy capital ships. Exceptionally good news, considering that Yanari fleet has over 50 of them. Which is probably why Yanari commander decided to hold their position and fight us head on. And so, in late February 2299, the battle for Ebu Krossi system has begun, and it's the largest one we ever took part in. It began relatively straightforward, with long-range barrage of missiles, torpedoes and laser shots, which are most reliable weapons at long distances. And when we speak of long distances, we really mean it. Back when Manticore fought its first real battle against the Zbraken Union, the effective engagement range of our ship-mounted weapons was up to 200 kilometers. But today, thanks to our new sensors, calibrating computers and, of course, better guns, said range can reach up to 15,000 kilometers. So, while it was possible to look out the viewport and see enemy ships with naked eye during Battle of New Sajar, mother version of Space Warfare is much, much different. Instead of firing at enemy warships bristling with weapons fire, our deckers fire at dots and holograms on their radars, never really seeing the foe they're trying to kill, and vice versa. Only sometimes, when particularly large ships go down, external cameras register blinks of light no brighter than surrounding stars, but still signifying explosions of massive reactors and death of hundreds or thousands of people. Now, thanks to our technological advantage we had a chance to fire first shots in this battle, but our enemies improved as well, and soon the long-range exchange of fire began in full. As for the tactics, Admiral Ibrahim went for her tried and tested strategy of two pincet flanking move, with our navy splitting into two groups and moving to the sides of enemy formation, so that no matter which group they turn to, another one will always have a chance to flank them. But, like we learned during Invasion of Billy One Space, one of our ships is not really suited to such tactics. Our dreadnought sears the Archon. It's simply too slow to commit to wide and circling maneuvers, so instead it just charges forward, using its impressive array of weapons to blow holes in enemy formation. A maneuver that would be suicidal for our other ships, but Archon's defenses mean that it can take the firepower of entire Yanari fleet for a good long while, before they could even break through her shields. Or so we thought. Turns out, Yanari took a page out of our book and developed some torpedoes themselves, and just like ours, they can bypass shields. And very soon, Archon suffered some hull breaches. Nothing major, but it's still a symbolic defeat for us, as the pride of our fleet was bruised for the first time. Fortunately, we still have our carriers, which are covered in point defense lasers, as you could have seen there, so we managed to take down most of enemy torpedoes before they caused us any significant damage. But the same was true for our enemies, and if anything, 
everything. This battle clearly proved that Yanari fleet designers really took the lesson of their previous war against us to heart. As you may remember, when we met them last time, their warships relied almost solely on missile launchers, firing barrage after barrage of them, hoping to overwhelm our defences. Thing is, with our PD lasers, we shot the vast majority of these missiles down before they reached us, effectively rendering their fleet useless. And while they still mostly use launchers, although newer, improved models, they also added some railguns and PD guns to their ships, in order to protect themselves from our torpedo spam. But, as was said, even though they can't shoot down some of them, they can't down them all, especially since, aside from said torpedoes, we fire a decent amount of antimatter missiles ourselves, which forces Yanari gunners to choose between several incoming projectiles at any given moment. So, we have pretty much the same problem. Sure, our carriers can place a very effective screen using their PD lasers, but because we added second launcher to our corvettes, it meant that we had to demount the Velita lasers. So, ultimately, we ended up with less anti-missile firepower than we had before, and soon some of our smaller ships started to suffer because of it. Because while our destroyers and corvettes can relatively easily dodge incoming shots, they can't really outrun guided missiles, and as the battle progressed, some of these ships disappeared as Yanari gunners focused their barrage on them. Our larger ships, on the other hand, performed very well. On the right flank, for example, our two battleships, Ponyatovsky and Legacy, formed a two-vessel strike team, focusing their fire on any Yanari capital ship that exposed itself or broke formation. Within the first few minutes of the battle, our two newest additions to the fleet managed to down at least six hostile capital ships using their newly developed weapons. So, not only is that a successful test run of them, but also a sign that we should upgrade the rest of our navy as soon as we're able. But although the battle was relatively straightforward, but still terrifying, there was one more thing that made it stand out, namely, the presence of Mirovandian fleet on the field. As was mentioned last time, they are fighting the intent together with the Anari, and their navy is following theirs, but Miravandians are not at war with us, which makes them a third neutral party in this fight. They moved away when first shots were fired to avoid being hit by some stray missile, but still their presence unnerved both sides. For us, we worried that they may join the fight on the Anari side at some point, and attack us from behind, and the Anari, in all probabilities, tried to convince them to do just that. Fortunately, these planters decided to honor their non-aggression pact with us and remained stationary for an entire battle. Not that their presence could change the final outcome, but they still could have caused us a lot of grief with a surprise attack. In the end, though, the battle turned in our favor. Once we took out enemy screening ships, our capitals and bombers focused their fire on larger Yanari vessels and, one by one, turned them into space dust with help of constant barrage of our torpedoes. The slavers fought back as hard as they could, but with every ship they've lost, our advantage only grew more. Soon, there were only a handful of battlecruisers left, and every time they fired their missile tubes, our PD guns instantly knocked their weapons out of the sky, meaning that, at the very end of this engagement, we were just shooting fish in a barrel. Finally, on February 15th, 2299, 19 hours after the battle started, the last red dot on Admiral Ibrahim's display vanished. The battle for Ebu Krosi was won, and the victory was total. We have lost 24 vessels, 12 corvettes and 12 destroyers, and overall 6,500 men during this fight. But the Yanari fleet was annihilated to the last, with around 90 ships destroyed, with only a handful of survivors, including their admiral, fleeing in escape ports towards the safety of Mirovandian fleet, where we will not chase them. Not that it matters. We have turned the tide of this war in a single battle, not only for us, but also for our friends in the intent, who should now have no problems dealing with Mirovandian fleet on its own. Perhaps it would have been better for them to join the fight with their Yanari comrades, but what's done is done, and these plantoids will now have to rush back home and prepare for federal counterattack. As for us, though, Manticore is actually in an extremely good shape now. Yes, we might have lost some of our smaller ships, but those that survived the battle are either completely untouched or only lightly damaged, which means that our support cruisers can deal with repairs on the go. And that's what we're going to do. Mantico will make a short stop at Thrust Sangor to attend to their wounded and officially relieve our ground forces, but once that's done, we will move out again. Initiative is ours once more. Let's use it.
Good evening, Nesta. Sorry for the delay. The shuttles were suspended for an hour because of some military convoy. No problem, Roman. Our soldiers fighting the slavers have priority, after all. You want something to drink so we could toast them? Plus, of course, your own fight against the Grim Ripper himself must be exhausting. There is no need for mockery, Nesta. If you don't approve my transhumanist project, then simply say it and we'll never discuss the matter again. I... No, Roman, that's not what I had in mind. Though, now that you mention it, it sounded a lot less rude in my head. So, I'm sorry. Hell, if anything, I'm excited about the whole affair. Here we are, on the verge of becoming something more, and it's all thanks to your brilliance, Roman. Maybe that will finally shut that hero up for a while. I don't follow. What do you mean by it? Oh, you know, we all work ourselves to exhaustion every day, but it's Adhira who's always in the spotlight. Every time the media come to the Science Council, they always talk to her. Every time we're covered on the extranet, it's about her and her division, like we don't even exist. But if this project of yours works out, everything will change. Sure, but I don't see why Adhira's presence in the media should... Wait, no. Nesta, are you jealous? I... I suppose I am. I think I just needed someone to say it out loud to make sure of it. I know it's unreasonable and counterproductive, but I can't help it. And it's not about attention, I don't give a damn if journalists are camping in front of a lab all the time, but about recognition. Her work is important, sure, there's no denying that, but so is mine, and yours for that matter. Every ship that we use to travel, every weapon that we fire at the enemy, every habitat station, these are results of hard work of our respectable divisions. But there's no recognition, not even a thank you most of the time. I see. I understand what you mean, Professor, and you're both right and wrong here. Yes, general population doesn't recognize our efforts because we provide mostly mundane things, or things that work in the background, reactors, mines, stations. People don't bother with things like that unless they directly affect them, not to mention, of course, that these mundane things are usually far more complicated than they seem. Good luck trying to explain how an antimatter reactor works to a man who works in retail. But things like creation of new life, like gene therapies that can make us live to 200 years, now that's something that everyone can notice and understand, at least to some degree. And finally, do you really need people to applaud you and your work? Just look outside the window, at the city so large that you can see its edge despite being 8 kilometers above ground, at the line of ships that fly for orbit. Everything around us, that entire interstellar machine that we call Commonwealth, is the result of work of you, me, and people in our divisions. And, for me at least, that very knowledge is enough. You're right. Sorry, Roman, I think I just spent too much time working lately and the stress started to get to me. No problem. And besides, there is another reason for Adhira's presence in the media. You see, when we develop something, it's usually a combined work of thousands of people in our departments working together to solve a problem. But Adhira is a department herself. Take those gene therapies, for example. It's her work from start to finish. Same thing with cloning. Even that breathtaking feat of creating new sentient life is in 50% based on her work alone. So no wonder people want to get close to her, because she's a bloody genius. Tell me, Nesta, have you ever seen her in her natural habitat? You know, just sitting in her lab, working on something? Come to think of it, no. Weird, especially considering that we're co-workers for almost a century now. Well then, I had a chance to witness that recently, when I brought her my cybernetic arm and asked for help developing neural interface. Or maybe rather, I wanted to ask for help. I was about two sentences in when she interrupted me, because of course she did, and started just figuring everything out herself. I spent 20 minutes there, staring at her just mumbling to herself and typing something on her computer, and when she finished she handed me a solution, before I even told her what I wanted. She just grabbed a single straw and unraveled the whole project on her own, before my tea went cold. The very fact that figuring out the first half took me and my department several months is enough to make me never question her intelligence again. I only wish she would pass her genes further down the line. Damn, maybe the reason she talks so much about evolving humanity is because she is already several steps ahead of us. If only she had some space for morals in that brilliant head of hers. Ah, but we are not here to obsess over our dear colleague. I have the sample right there on the table. Go take a look, you're going to like it. Ah, of course. Been a while since I last saw this living metal, and certainly not under such a good microscope. Let's see... It looks almost like a fluid that stopped moving for some reason, like it is suspended in time. Thought so myself for a while, then I looked closer. Okay, I'll bite. 
No way, are those what I think they are? Yep, molecule-sized machines that, apparently, can cooperate with each other to create perfectly solid yet fully malleable substance. So much for the theory about this being just some rare mineral. But, because these are machines, it means they can be programmed to do what we want. Now I see why you wanted me on this project. Hell, Nestor, this is big. It could revolutionize nearly every aspect of our civilization. Could, but it won't, at least until we figure out how the hell something like that even works. For me, it's mostly going to be the question of how to build something so complex while keeping its microscopic size. And as for you, you need to figure out what makes it tick, and how to teach it to do the tricks we want. Indeed. But there's another question, and I don't think any one of us is qualified to answer it. Who the hell made this thing in the first place? So then, with Yanari fleet out of the way, the most dangerous part of the conflict is behind us. At least until they rebuild, but given the fact that they are fighting on two fronts, they probably won't be able to raise any considerable navy in this war. Which means that both Manticore and our ground troops can get back to work capturing another planet. While back home, our researchers can turn their attention into more economic and social inventions, while the government can once again start funneling money into civilian projects. And just in time, because, as you can see, our private contractors have just finished building up a basic infrastructure on gas giant Atausneria 8, officially making it habitable, at least to a certain degree. Because, according to all reports, while these floating platforms our people built in the upper atmosphere can house our habitats, the conditions there aren't exactly pleasant. For one, the gas giant has extremely high gravity, making everything from constructing new buildings to simply living there much more difficult than usual. Additionally, the temperature up in these clouds is very high as well, forcing all potential colonists to constantly remain within air-conditioned environments, something that our cold-liking people will probably not enjoy, especially since their homes will constantly be rocked by gale 4 winds and thunderstorms. But that's just the beginning of dangers that await our settlers there. See, while construction crews managed to build a decent amount of these floating platforms, around half of the planet is still uninhabitable, due to regions with extremely high atmospheric pressure, which, when paired with aforementioned storms, are so dangerous and so destructive that some of the companies that tried to establish their own platforms there actually went bankrupt before finishing their contracts, leaving us with several hundred unfinished construction facilities just floating in the sky out there. So, as you can see, we still have a lot of work ahead of us before colonization of this gas giant could be considered successful, but at the very least we made the most important first step. Soon, a colony ship will be dispatched from Ortis, bringing on board hardy colonists who, hopefully, will turn this inhospitable ball of gas into something truly useful for the Commonwealth. And speaking of usefulness, back on our recently colonized barren planet of Aziren, a second batch of artificially created creatures have just finished their gestation period and is now ready to deploy. And one remarkable thing there is just how quickly our research teams were able to develop these new beings, a clear sign that we have learned quite a lot during creation of the Vryn. In fact, the most time-consuming part of the project was deciding on how we want this new species to look like. The Vryn are similar to us, but that actually made many of our citizens slightly uncomfortable, especially given their practically non-existent social skills. So instead, when we created this new race, someone on the research team proposed that, maybe, we could use our new animal friends, the monarch eagles from Zema, as a sort of template for these new creatures. An idea that immediately gathered tons of supporters, especially since we actually don't have too many avian-looking aliens in our empire, with few billion of Helvan being the only ones. So, once the decision has been made, all gestation pods went through a quick cosmetic genetic adaptation, and few weeks later, two billion new bird-like citizens rose from their slumber on Azirin's surface, and immediately we realized that this experiment was an astounding success. These people, named Till Linesi, are able to survive on the surface of a barren, atmosphereless planet without any kind of life support or even environmental suits. In fact, they are their own life support, their internal organs providing their bodies with everything they need using only sunlight. So, 
Although they look like birds, Linessi are actually more closely related to plants. Now, of course, feeding off sunlight is not the only way these creatures can feed, and they can still enjoy a nice meal just like every other one of us, especially when living underground, but it's not necessary for their survival. So, a success on biological scale, but just like with the Vryn, we still have to teach our new citizens how to be a part of society, and thanks to the lessons from Morana, we now know that leaving them on their own is a bad idea. Instead, just like the Vryn today, we're going to send the Lenisi all across the Commonwealth and embed them in every single aspect of our society, so that they could learn our way of life. Or, well, any way of life for that matter. Basically, people all around our nation will sort of adopt them. Only thing is, they will be adopting creatures that are fully grown adults physically, but mentally and socially they're even less developed than a newborn child. Long road ahead then, both for Linessi and the Vryn, but at the end of it lies truly sentient existence, a prize worthy of hard work. And right now, no one works harder than our military. After dealing with the Yanari fleet, Mantico once again cleared a path to Avasanea system, this time without any surprises, and resumed the bombardment of Yanari colony of Frishak, which actually took a bit longer than usual because, to our surprise, our foes developed some special defenses while we were dealing with their fleet, namely a planetary shield generator, which greatly reduced efficiency of our orbital strikes. Still, without their fleet to chase us away, the only thing Yanari managed to gain with that shield was a slight delay, less than two weeks, and right now, as you can see, our troops are already on the ground, taking out defenders who are clearly demoralized after losing their entire navy. Yanari had more troops this time, including their infamous slave armies, which they used as meat shields, but in the end they were no match for a wave of battle droids and spiders, and roughly six weeks after first drop pods with our ray water droids landed on the surface, the last defenders of Frishak have surrendered to our infantrymen, who must have been a welcome sight after days of fighting nightmarish arachnids and soulless automatons. So, another victory has been won with relatively minor losses, but it's clear that the deeper we move into Yanari territory, the more troops they're going to throw at us, which means that we need to get a move on. While they won't be able to rebuild a proper fleet in time, they can still muster millions of soldiers, especially if they're using slaves, and use them to completely bog us down. As such, we're not going to wait. While our ground troops will patch up their wounded and, again, organize some freed slaves into rushed militia, Mantico will charge forward and prepare another system for our arrival. And speaking of Mantico, you may have noticed that CSV Archon is no longer moving with it. It was sent back to our own space, where it will await construction of few additional ships that, together with our Dreadnought, will form a secondary strike force. Now, sending a powerful ship like that back home in the middle of the war may seem like an odd idea, but in truth, after Yanari fleet was eliminated, CSV Archon caused us more trouble than it provided benefits, simply because it slowed down Mantico and our entire invasion to a crawl. So for now, it's going to be benched, but once we get it some escort ships, it will be able to take the fight to the enemy once again, and let's not forget that new task force means new chances for aspiring officers to gain the coveted title of Admiral. Once again then, it seems that everything goes well for the Commonwealth. Not perfect, but still better than anticipated, which I think is a pretty good summary of our entire previous century. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it has been 100 years since humanity took to the stars and began its new interstellar era. The celebrations were muted because of the war, but simply reminding our citizens of our accomplishments made them realize what an astounding leap we made. Within one century, we grew from a few countries on a single freezing planet to a nation that spans hundreds of light years. Our population grew from 9 billion to around 150 billion, and it's only humans we're talking about, a race that, by now, forms only around one third of the Commonwealth. Because, over these 100 years, we realized that we're not alone. We met aliens both friendly and hostile, and we learned great many things about them. But still, despite all our discoveries, despite all groundbreaking technological advances, it still feels like we barely scratched the surface. The galaxy may be mostly explored by now, but it still holds many secrets, and every time we find one answer, two new questions emerge, making us constantly move forward, faster, and more determined to unravel the mysteries that surround us. 
but it seems that the galaxy itself decided to remind us that despite everything we've done so far, there are still things that we can't wrap our heads around. And so, in May 2300, we received a very disturbing message. Our defensive station in Fulas system was calling for help. A bizarre squid-like creature nearly 50 kilometers long has appeared in the system and, to surprise of our crews, immediately started attacking our stations there, discharging energy in a way very similar to a laser gun. And within the first few seconds of this attack, our Falangite border guards realized just how dangerous this thing is, because every single one of these discharges was more powerful than anything we have ever seen before. Even CSV Archon, firing all its weapons at once, couldn't achieve such destructive firepower. Within seconds, the shields on both of our defensive station and our spaceport were gone, and soon the entity's attacks started carving both stations apart. Our positions returned fire as best as they could, but it was then when we realized another thing. Despite firing an entire barrage of missiles, laser shot and railgun rounds, we failed to cause this thing any harm. If anything, we only angered it. But when it attacked us back, it completely demolished our positions. Within less than a minute of its appearance, the entity completely destroyed our orbital spaceport with thousands of people on board, without giving them a chance to even start running to the escape pods. Our border post had more luck, because it was far more sturdy, but it quickly became obvious that it's not going to save them. Their weapons were simply not enough to reliably damage this thing. And so, an emergency message was sent, both to CSV Archon and to Task Force Manticore, calling for their immediate return. But the crew of that station knew full well, even if our navy turns around immediately, it will still take them quite a long time to get back, time that our Phalangites clearly don't have. But fortunately, these people were too busy fighting for their lives to ask another question. If Manticore makes it back, will it be enough to even make a dent in this thing? Okay, Agent Bishop, let me make sure I understood everything correctly. You're claiming that, over the past few decades, Zrakan Union somehow invaded minds of some of our citizens and used them to eliminate all those who uncovered true extragalactic origin of our Carthaman neighbors. Now, the first obvious question is, why did it take us so long to actually understand their motives? The second one is, why? Why would they focus on something so specific while they could use this ability to cause complete chaos within our nation? I'm afraid I don't know, Madam Chancellor, but if I had to bet, I'd say it was for diplomatic reasons. We suspect that first attacks like that started when Kingdom of Yadra was still cooperating with Zraken and Yanari, but they were also the weakest link of their alliance. Perhaps Zraken leadership thought that finding out that both our species arrived in this galaxy from some other one would turn Yadrans away from their allies and towards us. But as for our poor performance during investigation of these attacks, I'll be honest with you, Madam Chancellor. If not for the fact that Zraken became sloppy in recent months, we would still be blundering in the dark. Fortunately, it seems that they grew so confident in their own psionic powers that they forgot to tie all loose ends after the last few attacks. But while their overconfidence worked to our benefit in this case, I'm afraid that things will only become worse in the coming years. Task Force Ethereal compared data from our previous encounters with the Union, current readings from the Compass Station, and reports of Agent Rook, and we reached a very disconcerting conclusion. Zraken understanding and mastery of psionic powers have grown beyond anything we even thought possible in recent years. I believe it's safe to assume that, at this point, their entire society awakened their innate powers, and knowing them, they won't have any issues using them against all enemies of their deranged faith. Understood. What can we do about it, then? At this point, I'm not sure if anything other than complete extermination of the Zraken would help. We could attack them and occupy their worlds, but their people would constantly fight back. And believe me, policing a planet with several billion hostile psionics would be a suicide. But what we could do is try and sever connection they have to their powers. We believe that psionic energy comes to us from some other plan of existence another universe, or some other place that we can't even begin to understand. What we can do, however, is sense where that energy enters our own world. For us, it's the Asian Pyramid, and for the Zraken, it's some place on their homeworld of Zrag. According to Agent Rook, there is a massive vortex of energy somewhere on the surface, possibly the birthplace of their religion, which acts as a center point of Zraken power. 
If we could get close to it, we could probably find some way to cut the flow of energy off, or maybe even redirect it towards us. Just imagine what we could do with abilities like these. Yes, we could get into other people's heads and force them to murder their longtime friends. Not exactly something that I want to do, Agent Bishop, but I understand what you mean. After all, the powers themselves are not evil or destructive, only those who use them are. But I'll be honest, I don't see how we could convince the Council to your plan, considering that you have no idea if it would even work. If anything, spreading this information could cause a panic or widespread paranoia amongst our people, since practically any one of us could be asleep as Rakan agent. You could be one, for all I know. Not exactly. From what we understand, only those with psionic powers, awakened or not, can be affected by mind control. Others are probably not linked to the same energy flow. In the Commonwealth, that gives around 1% of the population, and actually those whose powers have manifested have better chance of resisting, since they know the warning signs. It's those who don't know about their abilities who are most vulnerable. But because awakening these abilities seems to be happening at random, we can't control it. So it seems that attacking Zrak and Homeworld might really be the only option to stop these attacks. What do you think, Ishii? I have some ideas, but they can wait. Right now, this entire discussion can wait. We should focus on that creature that appeared above Nada. It's just an animal. I dealt with something like that with a handful of Akulas, and Ibrahim is, well, better admiral than I ever was. She'll have this thing mounted on a wall in no time. If only. I just received a message from Morana Observation Post. Mantico entered the system, took one look at this beast, and stopped. Ibrahim says she's not going to engage this thing without Archon and every single ship we can master. I think the situation just got a whole lot more complicated.